I am very happy to see all of you again today. It is nice to be amongst friends. We are all friends. We don't know it. You Sometimes we forget. There are no strangers. They are all friends. Sometimes we are friends who have known each other. Sometimes we are friends who still get to know each other. The reason is our limited vision of time. We think time flows only in one direction, from past to present to future. And we think what is in the future is still to come. It may or may not come. It may be different than what we think. It may not be according to our anticipation. It may not be according to our hopes. But the truth is, as deep meditation can reveal, the truth is that time is a fixed thing, as fixed as space. I can't say because I have to travel from California to Chicago that as I travel, Chicago will come up. Chicago is already there. And I just travel on space, in space, and arrive in Chicago. In the same way, tomorrow, day after, next year, thousand years from now, are already there. We are time traveling. People used to marvel how the Egyptians found a way to time travel without realizing we are all time traveling, all the time. We are traveling from moment to moment, minute to minute, hour to hour. But the belief that we are not traveling on time, time is passing through us, creates the illusion that nothing has really happened in the future. It will happen as we go along and we can change it and a lot of changes will take place. This is a great mistake because of the illusion of the nature of time. If we knew that time was flat and that all things that could be placed on time have already been placed there, that all future events have been predetermined, our view on time would be very different. Our approach to time would be very different. Our life would be very different. I had a very strange experience in India. I had gone for an interview to join the Indian Navy. After the interview, I came out, and there was a man with a turban standing outside, and he said to me, good luck, do you have a piece of paper? I had some pieces of paper, so I gave a piece of paper. And he said, do you have a pen or pencil to write with? So I gave him my pen. He took the paper, looked at my eyes, and began to write something on it. Then he folded the paper twice and said, hold this paper in your hand. So I held the paper in my hand. And he said, do you have another piece of paper? I said, sure. I didn't know what he had written. And I didn't know why he wanted another piece of paper, but I had in my, in my pocket another piece of paper, so I gave him. Then he said, now you write on this piece of paper. Any number between 1 and 10. And I said, this is an old trick people play. When they say, write between 1 and 10, everybody has a tendency to write 5, which lies in the middle. I am not going to go, I'll call his bluff. And I am not going to write 5. I wrote 3. He said, write the name of a flower. And I knew that the most common flower in India is rose. And everybody will say, write the name of a flower. The first reaction will be, write rose. And this man is hoping that I will write rose, and I'm not going to write it. I'll write the name of a flower this guy may never have heard of. Because this interview took place in Uttar Pradesh, another state. And I said, I know the name of a flower that occurs in another state, in Punjab, where I come from. And I will write the name of an unknown flower, a rare but good flower called Chameli. So I wrote Chameli, C-H-A-M-E-L-I. I wrote that. And I had a smile that he was, I was calling off his bluff. He said, write, of, write your date of birth. I wrote 1926. That was the year I was born. He said, no, no, I wanted you to write the date of birth, not the year of birth. So after 1926, I wrote November 26. Normally, we don't write like that. We write the year at the end. He said, now open the paper I gave you. 
before you wrote all this. I opened the paper. It said 3 Chameli, 1926, and then my date. Exactly what I wrote. And he written it beforehand. I was completely amazed. How could he write something that I had not even thought of? I, I was so nonplussed by this event. I said, how could you possibly do this? Because I was making my decision on what to write after you had written the paper. He said, shall I tell you a little more? I said, go ahead. He said, when I said, write a number between 1 and 5, you thought I am going to call his bluff off and not write 5 but write 3. When I asked you to write the name of a flower, you said, everybody writes rose and I am going to write a name of a flower he's never heard of. And you wrote Chameli. He gave me exactly the words of my thought which occurred after he had written the paper. That was the first very strong evidence to me that what we think is a future we are determining by our free will, by our free choice, is not only predetermined, the process of choosing, the process of going through the factors of choice, what we should choose and not choose, is also predetermined. And because those factors of choice are so designed to give us a feeling of free will, we think that we are now making a decision and this was not in the future ahead of it. The truth is, and he demonstrated to me. I asked him how he did it. He told me he has a Baba, is a, is a psychic kind of person who has taught him how to do this and it needs a certain kind of meditational practice to be able to see five minutes or ten minutes in advance of what a person will be thinking. He could not only read my thoughts, he could read my thoughts that were still not there, that were still in the future. That means he could read in great detail the next five minutes of my own thinking process. What confuses us is, what confused me was, that I am making a decision whether to choose one or the other. And he knows beforehand that how I will choose and what choice I will make, which I am thinking is totally free will, it's unknown, the, the options are mine completely, I could write one or the other, but he knew that when we think that we have a free will and we can do whatever we want, what we will do with the free will is predetermined. And that makes free will look absolutely real. Free will is the greatest illusion that we ever had because it looks absolutely real. Illusion means something that looks real, but it's not real. Free will is a great example of that. I was studying in this country at Harvard University and there was another student of psychology who used to call me every day and discuss whether the spiritual stuff we talk about is all psychological suggestion, is just the power of suggestion that we think of these things, or is it something more real than that? And we had discussion every day. So, and there were a couple of professors who were also interested in that. So they used to tell me, that this uh, idea that through meditation you can see a lot of things can all be induced by the power of suggestion. The mind is a very powerful instrument we have and by suggesting something to it, you can hypnotize people, you can make them believe things, you can cause uh, strange scenes to appear before them, you can cause hallucinations to appear by suggestion. So don't you think that what you think is a meditational experience could be merely a power of suggestion, auto-suggestion you're giving to yourself and being told by some guru, some master, that you will see this light and this color and you then suggest to yourself you're going to see that and you close your eyes and you begin to see that by power of suggestion only. What makes you believe that is something real? And I told them, those professors, you are absolutely right. It could be the power of suggestion. Indeed, I agree it's the power of suggestion. 
I said, all that we see is power of suggestion, but I go a step further. What you're seeing outside now is no more than the power of suggestion too. What you think is real life around you is being created by the same process. Do you have any evidence that it's occurring any other way? Through meditation, at least you can find out that not only the scenes that you see in meditation are being created by your mind, you also find out that the entire life you lead is being created by your own mind. So therefore, I acknowledge that the power of suggestion is very strong. Then one of the students said that if this is so, then we wouldn't have any real free will because as a religious student, I have to believe in the power of God. He said, I believe there is a God and he's omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. That means he is not only present everywhere, that God knows everything. Omniscient means he knows everything. Then God must know what we are going to decide. If God doesn't know that what we are going to decide, that means we are superior to God. That we are going to make a decision with our free will and we can choose whatever we like and God doesn't know about it. How can he be God? How can he be omniscient? Based on this theory, he came to the conclusion that we cannot have free will because God's will must cover what we think is our free will and what we think we are going to decide is already known to God. Therefore, if you believe that God is omniscient, then we cannot have free will. So early morning, one day, he called me. He said, I found out. Eureka! There is no free will because either God knows everything or we can do choose things freely. Both cannot coexist. I said, thank you for informing me. Will you come over and have a cup of tea or coffee with me? I'd like to discuss this further. So quickly he came to my apartment and I prepared for him on a tray a cup of tea and a cup of coffee and an empty cup. So when he came, I said, would you like to have tea or coffee or nothing? I've got all three here and you have no free will. So without free will, tell me what you're going to have. And he said, all my knowledge was stumped with just three cups like this. <laughs> I said, no, you, you say you have no free will. And I am presenting to you three options. Tell me you have no free will. I am going to prove to you, you don't have, you not only have free will, you're trapped by free will. There's no way you can escape free will because you have to make a choice. The moment we have to make a choice, we have to exercise free will. So what makes you say that you have no free will? I'm presenting just a cup of coffee and tea and say, what do you want? And you have to choose. Every day in our life, we have to make choices. Every day we decide which way to turn. Every day we decide what is good for us, what is not good for us. Every moment we are making decisions. How can we say we don't have free will? He said, this has been a big setback for me in my knowledge. <laughs> I thought we had no free will, and you just proved with this cup of tea and coffee. I said, now I'll be the devil's advocate, and now I'll tell you that you have no free will. With the same cups, I'll tell you. He said, how is that possible? I said, look, when I say, will you have tea or coffee, how do you decide freely? What are the factors of choice in your head that make you decide one or the other? Let's look at all the possibilities. What possibilities exist for you to choose between tea and coffee? There are only two sets of factors. One, hereditary, genetic. Your dad liked coffee, your grandfather liked coffee, somebody in your family, it comes in your genes, you like coffee. Second set of factors are environmental that you lived with people who like coffee, you got a cultivated taste for coffee, therefore you like coffee. There is no third set of factors influencing your free will. When I offered you tea and coffee, both those factors were completely fixed already. You could not change your genetic makeup, nor could you change the environment through which you had come up to that point. Therefore, though the experience you had was of free will and choice, you had no way to choose anything but coffee. 
Therefore, if I could read the factors of choice in your head beforehand, I could write in advance that free will will be exercised by him and he'll choose coffee. What kind of free will is that? <laughs> there is no free will. Because what we think is free will is predetermined by the way we freely choose. So that is why it's the greatest illusion that we have. And yet, it's a very wonderful illusion. And I want to tell you, and that is the subject of my talk today, how wonderful this illusion is, because the illusion of free will makes us a seeker of truth. If you didn't have the illusion of experience of free will, you could never be a seeker. Seeking cannot take place if you, feel, if you don't feel you have a choice. That is why, although the experience may be just an experience of choice, it's a real experience. The experience of making a choice is a real experience. How it happens, at what level it is predetermined, it's a separate thing. But you do experience that you have to make a choice. It is the choice-making capacity in a human being that makes that human being a seeker of truth, a seeker of God, a seeker of reality, or seeker of anything. And when you seek, you will find. If you don't seek, you will not find. Therefore, the illusion of free will has been granted to us as the greatest gift to a human being in order to be a seeker and make this life purposeful. People want to know what is the purpose of human life. The purpose of human life is to seek and to be able to find who you are, to find what is the truth behind all this show that's going on. We forget that no matter what the mechanics of this free will are, the seeking is being given to us as a unique favor. In the Indian literature, on the scriptures, they have recorded that there are 8.4 million species of life forms, starting from plants and going into insects and birds and mammals and human beings and angels. They listed them all as different forms in which life can exist, in which consciousness can exist. In that list, more than half the list, about 5.4 million, are in the plant life, in the plant world. And then finally, in the final list of 400,000 comes a human being out of 8.4 million species of life forms, only one life form has the experience of free will, the human being. Do you see the uniqueness of it? Only a human being has the experience of choosing between different alternatives and have that actual experience. Only a human being can use this free will to seek and therefore to find. That's the main purpose of a human life. It's the greatest form of life that can be created. The human being has been created as the next best thing to the creator himself. They say that man has been made in the image of the creator. You might have heard that. Does it mean the creator has eyes and nose and ears like us, has a body like us? Of course not. Creator is just a power. It's a creative power that creates everything, including creators. The creative power is not something that you can compare in form with a human being. But then what is great resemblance between a human being and the creator? This is the resemblance. The creator's will has created the whole show and was real, true free will. And the human being has an illusion, an experience of free will and makes choices the same way and thinks he's next to God and begins to create things the same way. But the same free will, the experience of free will, is the greatest gift we have in order to prepare ourselves for the real purpose of human life, that is to seek who we really are and to find that out while we are still here in the human body. So that is why when we talk of how do you prepare for the spiritual path, the answer is the first step is to seek. First step is that you must find that where you are, what life you're leading is not not the, what you want. So a man came to me once and he said, I am very happy and leading a great life. I enjoy myself. Why should I join the spiritual path? I said, you should not. You don't need to. You are happy. Go and enjoy yourself. After a week, he came back crying to me. He said, no, no, I have so much problems and so on. 
I have some moments of joy and pleasure, but most of the time I have been disappointed in this, I have been disappointed in that. So we sometimes do not realize that the spirit in us, the soul, which is pure consciousness, it is not a form. Our real form does not have any form. It is the power of consciousness, which is the power to be aware, the power to become conscious of anything that it wants to be. That's the real self. That self, always seeking, automatically to seek where it originates from. So the seeker is built into us. If we ignore the covers upon ourselves, we'll find we are automatic seekers. The longing for truth, the longing for the spiritual reality, spiritual truth, is automatic in all of us. We don't realize it because of the big, thick covers we have put upon ourselves, the cover of the mind that thinks and attaches itself to outside things, to outside experiences, the desires that link us through the sense perceptions to experiences outside, the physical body that's a big, thick cover upon us that doesn't let us see who we are. The light is hidden inside. These covers upon us have made it even impossible for us to know that our longing for the truth has always been there. When we are able to have an experience without these covers, we discover that we had a longing for the truth. We were seekers right from the beginning. And the seeking is in all of us. One of the ways the seeking is expressed is through loneliness. We want to feel that we are separated. We are lonely. We want to see how the loneliness can, can be overcome. Instead of trying to find out that our origin itself is not lonely, is totality, we go about looking outside to, to take care of our loneliness. We make relationships outside. We, we feel we have found our soulmates. And we find that the soulmates are no soulmates after a little while. People have come to me, young people have come to me, and they say, we are in love with each other, we found we are soulmates, we are just exactly like each other. And three months later, they tell me we are in the divorce court. And then they tell me, we knew from day one we were not made for each other. <laughs> but that's the same day they told me they were soulmates. <laughs> you see, this idea that we are able to find our partners in life. Yes, we can find partners in life for some time. We can find partners that last longer. At one time, the average rate at which people could stay married, the length of time for which people could stay married in this country, I understood some from statistics, was 40, 50 years people lived together. Then it came down. And do you know what the average today is? It's astounding. The average marriage stays for one week. <laughs> what have we come to? Where are the soulmates gone away? I sometimes feel that maybe there is some truth in the theory of soulmates. Because the truth is that when we transcend these divisions created by the mind, we are just one soul. And that one soul has no sex or gender. It's not male or female. Our reality is not male or female. It's one of the levels of illusions created to separate. The same soul, when it becomes split into two, into, into two genders, begins to believe it's, uh, it's looking for its soulmate. It descends into different kinds of life forms. And as we go through life in different forms, we are always searching for our partner, our soulmate. And when we can't find the soulmate, anyone close by who looks like that appeals to us, we say, soulmate. I sometimes give an example. If you go to a dinner party and have a stack of plates ready for them to take the, for the buffet dinner and pick up your plate, and before the party starts, the plate, stack of plates suddenly falls, and there's a crack in each plate. And then you quickly try to put them together, and you can't find which plate really matches each other. And you try to match as quickly as you can, and there's some chinks remain between them because they're not the exact matching plates. 
you stack them all together with little chinks. That's what our life is like, you know, searching for soulmates. We think we are putting ourselves together and we don't see the chinks to start with. And after a little while, we start seeing the chinks. It happens all the time. So therefore, this uh, search for soulmates in this world is itself an evidence of our loneliness, of our seeking for something that should make up for what is missing. Even when people have good relationships, they know internally that the relationship is skin deep. They know that this relationship is not going right to their hearts, is not going right to their souls. It is dealing with some things in a common way, but that you are not really meeting spiritually at one place. And therefore, the seeking continues. The loneliness does not arise because you are alone. You can be in the midst of a crowd and still be lonely. I see the most lonely people are in the bigger cities that I've visited. There are big crowds around. And some people sitting up in the mountains in the Himalayas, in the little caves, are not lonely at all. So therefore, loneliness is not affected by the number of people around you. It's affected by the state of your own mind, the state of separation that you're experiencing. The mind is a great separator. It separates. Its, its method of dealing with situations is analytical. Analysis means separate things and see them out. Break them into pieces and then see how the components work. That's the mental way. On the other hand, the spirit, which is our truth, which is our real self, has a synthesis, a way of putting things together and seeing the big picture all at once. They're two different systems. But the mind and the soul, they sit together in our consciousness, in our head. When I first came to this country, I met a lot of philosophers, and they all thought that mind and soul is the same thing. They say, you know, this uh, power of consciousness, mind, soul, whatever you like to call it. They would talk to me like that. And I said, don't you distinguish between the mind and the soul? They say, what's the distinction? That's consciousness. You can call it soul. You can call it mind. I said, of course not. See the big distinction that the mind will always function in time and space and follow the law of cause and effect. Always. In fact, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, said that the mind is not a mind, it's only the category, these three categories put together, we call it the mind. He gone that far. That unless you have time to think, you cannot have a thought. There is no thought in zero time. On the other hand, the soul, the spirit of consciousness per se, can have an intuitive feeling with no time whatsoever, not even a nanosecond. You don't know a thing, and suddenly you say, I know it. Therefore, there's a big distinction that the soul, the spirit of a human being, of consciousness, works beyond time and space, whereas the mind works in time and space. When you put them together and tie them together in a knot and think you are the mind, then you lose the sense of intuition. You lose the functions of the soul, and you begin to believe that the functions of mind alone are real. And because the mind believes in time, space, and cause and effect, you come through a cycle of events, which in the East and now in the West is called the law of karma. What is the law of karma? It's the law of cause and effect. We are not bound by law of cause and effect, but our mind is. When we identify ourselves with the mind, we become tied to the law of karma. When people do spiritual practices and they rise above the mind, they discover they were never bound by the law of karma. There was no karma. Karma was as much as illusion as free will was illusion. And if there is no free will, there can be no karma. Do you realize that? If you don't have a real choice, how can you be punished or rewarded for it? You can only be punished or rewarded if you are really making a mistake or making a good decision. If you can't even make it, it's already made. How could you have karma? So you have to see that this lack of knowledge of our own self, we don't know who we are, we are identifying ourselves with our minds, and all this mess is being created around us. And instead of enjoying the beauty of this grand creation, we are trapped into it. Why did we happen to come here if this is not our true home? 
if our true home is beyond the mind, beyond time and space, in a state of immortality, in a state of eternal bliss, what drove us to come back into this? What drove us here was adventure. We said we are going, going to adventure land. It's a Disneyland in a big scale. And we thought we'll have a great show at the carnival, and after the show we'll go home. Somehow we got caught in the rides here, and we never knew how we came here, how we got caught. The reason was we got caught by misidentification. We misidentified ourselves with the thing that was given to us to use. You were given a mind to use. You were given sense perceptions to use. You were given a physical body to use and have experiences here. And if you use these three things, it's a great experience, even today. You just know that these three things have been given for use in an adventure land, and after that you go home. If you know that much, you'll enjoy life. Your whole, percept, uh, your whole perspective on life will change. The reason why we are trapped here, we don't think. We think we are the body, first of all. And the body, any aches and pains on the body are aches and pains. That the body, if it gets damaged, we are damaged. Something is wrong, we try to beautify this body. We try to feed it all kinds of junk food, all kinds of tasty things, which may not be good nutritionally. We don't care. We think this body is ourself and we're having good time. Therefore, that's a big mistake. Second mistake, we think the sense perceptions that we are having through the body are real perceptions. We don't realize that if you don't have a body, you have better perceptions. You never experience them. With the meditation, one can. On the spiritual path, you can experience perceptions much clearer, much better than you can do when enclosed in a physical body. We have another ethereal body, an astral body inside this body, which has much better power of seeing, touching, tasting. The sight is better than 2020 in that eyes, even if you're blind with these eyes. Every sense is very acute with that. But we are covered with the physical body and we think all sense perceptions are arising because of the organs on this body. We have never had that experience. If we can have experiences by which we can withdraw our attention away from this physical body and have experience of who we really are, hidden inside the body, we'll find that our perceptions are themselves a cover upon ourselves. The sense perceptions are a body by themselves. There is no astral body as a separate body. The sense perceptions make it the body. And inside that is another body hidden. And we think it's a thinking function of ourself. It's not. The mind is not a function of consciousness. Mind is being powered by consciousness to think. It's a different thing. Mind is given to us as an accessory, as a tool, as a computer. It's a great, one of the finest computers installed in our consciousness, which consciousness powers, and then the mind can think. Just because we are th have got a thinking machine to use, we think we are the mind, and because we think that is what we are, we get into a trap. We are identifying ourselves constantly with the covers upon ourselves, and that is creating all the difficulties and mess up in this world. There would be no unhappiness whatsoever if we knew that this was just a show we put in costumes to come and see the show, that these are all three costumes that we're putting on, and none of, this, none of this stuff is going to affect us. We'll just cast them away and go back home after the show is over. We've come into a great stage, in a great play, in which we're putting on our costumes and playing. We are the audience and the actor at the same time. We forget that part. When we say that a person comes to me and says, my name is Dawn. I said, okay, Dawn, do you know that Dawn is not your name? I said, why not? The Dawn is the name of your body. It is given only to your body. Do you know your name? He said, what do you mean? There is another name I have. I said, Dawn, this is your body's name, Dawn, given by your parents or whoever, whoever gave you this name. But if you just withdraw your attention, and find out that there is something else in Dawn who is today functioning as Dawn and 100 years ago was functioning as something else and 300 years ago was having a different name. 
that you have had ten names in the last ten centuries in different bodies, in different form that you have come. Which is your name then? I said, Don, not only that. Out of ten names, you can't choose which one you have. You go further up and you'll find those names are also given to something that has only a thousand or two thousand years life. Inside you, inside those two, is a third thing called your mind, called your causal body, which has its own name. And that has been existing for three million years. The same mind has been existing. We have different lifespans of different covers. The costumes don't have the same length. The physical body is just 100 years. Anything 100, 110, 20, it won't be more than that. Compared to the life of the astral body inside, which has been lasting from 1,000 to 3,000 physical years. <clears throat> when you go into meditation, deep meditation, on the spiritual path, guided by a perfect living master, you will find that you can withdraw your attention from this body and discover who you were. It's like waking up from a dream. And then you not only discover that you have been there before, you discover that was your identity for a long time. And the physical body was a very temporary dream-like state. An analogy would be a dream in the physical universe that we have. When you go to sleep at night, you forget where you are sleeping. You adopt a new body that moves around in the dream. Now that's a different body in the dream. But you think that is yourself. It's the same self that awakes in the body and the same self that's in the center of the dream body. The dream body is not working separately if you're watching it. You are walk watching. You become that character in the dream. And therefore you take a different body and move out in the dream. You meet people. You have incidents. You have events. And you think they are all real. Till you wake up. When you wake up, you discover that was not your body. That was your dream body. That your real body was sleeping in the bed. And you find that your real body was different. And that the sleep dream lasted very little time. That the physical body is going to last much longer. But the fact that you had a dream does not mean that when you wake up, you still don't know if you are up, woken up or not. People ask me, are you sure that when we go to the next, next higher level of consciousness in meditation, are you sure it is not something that we're just making up imaginatively? Is there any evidence that we were really there for a long time? And I said, when you get up in the morning from your dream, are you sure you are woken up? Have you ever pinched yourself to see if you are awake? Have you called people to say, are you, am I awake? Or do you know you are awake? I said, I've never met a person in my life who was unsure on waking up in the morning that I'm awake. He didn't have to get any evidence. What made him so sure when we get up in the morning from a dream and we know we are awake? We don't even open our eyes. We don't even move our body. We are lying in the bed. We had finished our dream and we are awake. And without opening our eyes, we know we are awake. And at that time, if somebody came and said, you are not awake, you are dreaming, we'll never accept even if a thousand people came and said that. What is that proof that you're having? What is the kind of experience you are having that makes you so certain that you are awake? The experience is a very simple one. The experience is you remember that you went to sleep. You connect with the time before you went to sleep. That's the evidence. When you wake in the morning, you know you had gone to sleep there. The connection between the past in the physical body and the connection with the wakeful state now immediately tells you what happened in between for the dream. That's the real secret. It's the same secret that applies to the higher levels of consciousness. When you rise to the astral level of consciousness, you don't feel you're seeing some funny things there. You feel you are always there. You've always been there. You just had a little dip into another experience called the physical world. And that you have been there for a much longer time than the physical span that you had here. When you awaken away again to the causal plane, you have the experience you have been there forever, for millions of years. Same being, 
same memories, same you can trace back your memory of a million years back and remember it, recall it. That is how you know for certain that these are actual shifts in the levels of wakefulness, the levels of consciousness. It is not a make-believe that you just uh, make auto-suggestions to yourself and see strange experiences in meditation. True meditation under the guidance of a perfect living master gives us knowledge of this truth, that our truth is that we are a soul, we are consciousness, that we are covered by these bodies of a mind which creates thoughts, reasons, analysis, putting things together, interpreting sense perceptions. That's what the mind does. It's a great tool enabling you to communicate, to write, to speak. It's great, such a great gift given to us. The mind is one of the greatest gifts given to us if we use it. It's a terrible master if you allowed it to tell you what to do. But well, that's what we are doing. We are not using the mind to think what we want to think. We are letting the mind think randomly and then we follow it, what it is telling us to do. We put the cart before the horse. We've done exactly the opposite of what the intention was. The intention of having a body, the intention of having sense perceptions, intention of having a beautiful, wonderful device called the mind, or to use all of them and have a good time in the show that we are witnessing here. Instead of that, we began to take this as the only reality. There's no other reality available. We are discussing it all the time. We are questioning it ourselves. We stay in the same level. We don't even try. We don't even, somebody comes and says, look, this is not real. You wake up by meditation. No first proof to us that we will really wake up. First give us all the answers before we even try. It reminds me of a story in India. In the villages, they have some wells with no parapet walls. There are no walls, so the well is flat with the ground. So one philosopher, intellectual professor, he was walking, he fell into the well. And it was not very deep, so in the water he couldn't climb out. He was moaning and groaning, where have we got trapped into the well? And hearing his groaning and moaning in sounds, a passerby came and he said, oh, I'm sorry you fell into the well, I'll go and bring a rope to pull you out. He said, hold on, first tell me that you will really bring a rope. First tell me why I fell into the well. He said, look, I'll bring the rope, you come out, we can discuss these things afterwards. No, no, I must get my answers first. He says, wait. He goes and brings the rope and he says, now hold on to the rope and I'll pull you out. First guarantee that you will really pull me out. First, what is the certainty that you won't drop me halfway? The questions are unending. He said, all right, you keep the rope and you stay in the well. <laughs> Many of us are, are thinkers like that. We want all the answers before even trying to find out what's there. We are not willing to take any leap of faith. And the reason is that we have been made the slaves of our own minds. We've been taught to be the slaves of our minds. I remember in the 60s when I came in the classrooms of the universities to written think. I don't know if you remember many of them. Just think, think hard. Well, we think too much, I believe. We're thinking ourselves into all the mess. Imagine if you stopped thinking for a while, life would change. Because then you would live an intuitive life. You would live, live with a gut feeling. And how many of you have seen how often the gut feeling has been more true than all the rational thinking that we did? Because rational thinking has a little handicap, has a little disadvantage. And that is, we only think what we feed into the mind. Whatever data we have in front of us, we can't think beyond that. Therefore, we make our conclusion, we make our decisions based on that. A new thing comes up, and all our data goes wrong. And our decisions go wrong, our inferences go wrong. The mind does not function except in logic of two kinds, the deductive logic and the inductive logic. Some of you might have studied logic in school, would know that deductive logic means that you're given a certain data and the inference lies within that data. And that's deductive logic. For example, if I say that wall in this hall is painted in blue color and that's part of that wall, that's also blue, that deductive logic. The answer is known 
in the premises that have been given in the beginning. No new knowledge can come through deductive logic. Inductive logic says this wall is blue and turns around in all probability it's also blue. In inductive logic there's always uncertainty. It's called the great uncertainty principle in inductive logic, which means you can never have certain logic, certain information from any kind of logic. And yet we rely on the mind's logic for all our decisions. See, we are trapped into a very small segment of using our consciousness and thinking that that's the only instrument we have. And we poo-poo the very fact that we have the soul which is giving us intuitive knowledge all the time. Intuitive knowledge doesn't come from the data in front of you. Intuitive knowledge comes from all your past experiences, maybe of a million years. They all accumulate. And that's the knowledge that's pulled out by intuition. Intuition is, the, is from coming from the soul, which has no, no fixed life. It is immortal. It's always been there. So instead of getting knowledge from that source which lies inside us, which is our real self, we are relying upon a little instrument that is given to us with its, all its limitations, mm -hmm. which we can easily see. So what is, how do we go about the spiritual path? First, we should be a seeker. We are seekers. But we should recognize it. If we recognize that there is something missing somewhere, then we are a seeker. And anybody who says, I am very happy with what I have, well, enjoy it. Don't go after spirituality. You don't need it. Your, your spiritual thing is right here, which reminds me of a little naughty joke I heard. <laughs> it's about, it's about, a, about a church and a, and a pastor who had two parrots. And he trained those parrots to hold beads in their hands and pray. And they would pray and, uh, you know, take God's name and oh, Hail Mary. Whatever they were taught to do, they were praying with their beads in their hands. And very impressive to have two parrots in your house, always taking the name of God and worshipping in your house. Good atmosphere. Another one of the parishioners who used to go to that church, he used to admire these uh, parrots in the pastor's house. And he said, I also want to have this. So he went and bought two parrots also. And he brought them home, but he didn't discover they were female parrots. And when he opened the cage, the two female parrots said, we are hookers, have a good time. He was shocked. <laughs> what kind of parrots have I got? He immediately covered them up. He said, this is not right. Every time he would open, the two female parrots would say, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? He said, I got into a mess. He went to the pastor. He said, I tried to get two parrots to imitate your parrots and be good uh, worshippers of God. And look what has happened. He said, oh, I'll do something. I'll send my good parrots. And in their company, your parrots may improve and may also start holding beads and may also uh, start praying. So he said, OK. So he borrowed those two parrots from the pastor and brought them home. And when he put those two parrots, the male parrots, in front, and he opened his two parrots, the female parrot said, we are hookers. You want to have a good time? And one of the male parrots said to the other parrot, throw your beads away. Our prayers have been answered. <laughs> <laughs> what are we looking for? <laughs> we think everything has to come from here. We think our prayers have to be answered by the physical things we can get here. What do we pray for? Think of it. Do we pray for knowledge? Do we pray for reality? Do we pray for self-realization, God-realization? Have you heard people's prayers? They pray like the parrots. <laughs> so that's why it's, it's very important that if you want to be prepared for the spiritual path, you should feel this is not the place that you belong to. If that feeling is not there, and you feel you belong here, you're having a good time, throw the beads away. <laughs> then just have a good time. But if you feel this is not your place, this is not where you belong, and you have seen this world looks alien to you, that you belong somewhere else, then you are prepared to be a seeker. 
And then you seek. And then the greatest preparation is to treat the body into which you are going to seek with great respect. All religions, to the best of my knowledge, have described the human body as the temple of the Creator. They have said that the human body is a temple of living God. They not only say it's temple of God, they say that this is a temple of a living God, a conscious God, a God that you can access, talk to, and be with. Not one that you can just worship who's sitting somewhere else, but one who resides inside you and can be accessed by you and discovered by you, that living God is in the body. Then the body is really a temple. It's a more valuable temple than any temple that we can make. Any churches, any synagogues, any mosques that we build outside are all copies. If you study the architecture, temple architecture in history, you'll be surprised that it's a copy of the head of a person. Whatever head gear they were, they used to wear a tall type, type of head gear. They made the steeples of the temple, of the churches like that. The dome, Buddhist domes are all the shaven and shorn monks, and all the domes are similar to that. You'll see that the outside buildings that we made were supposed to be a replica, a copy of the real temple, which is our own body. And in this body also, the whole of the body is not the temple. Only the area above the eyes is the temple. The head from the eyes up is the real temple of God. Is a real temple of reality into which you can find everything. All the answers of the world, all the reality of the world, the reality of the soul, the reality of God lies inside, behind the eyes and up top of the head. This little place is all that you need to go into. In the name of the same God who resides inside, how many people are killing each other today? In the name of God. They take the name of God. Look at history. History is full of. We, in order to protect a building made by us, if some brick is broken in a building that we made, we destroy the temple that God has made by thousands. How can we be seekers of the truth if this is the way we are treating the temple of the living God, the temple in which he resides, where he can be found? We have to give respect to the human body. To give respect to the human body, to put all kinds of strange junk food into it, you wouldn't throw, you don't throw anything into a place of worship that we have built. We said, no, it's a very holy place. We can't throw trash into the place, but we're throwing trash into this body. So how, could, how can we say we are preparing for spirituality if this is how we're treating the body? In the church, in the temple, we don't speak loudly. We speak in whispers. It's not... And in the head, we are shouting, screaming all the time in our thoughts. What are we doing to the real temple? So if we are really going to prepare for spirituality, we ought to treat this temple with the respect that it deserves, the sanctity it deserves. So the very first step is to make it a sanctified place. Good thoughts good food. On the matter of food, the mystics for a long time have said that it is good to have vegetarian food, food that does not involve killing of animals. They realized that life subsists on life. You can't live on stones and on dirt. You have to live, even plants have life. Even if you're a vegetarian eating plants, you're still consuming life. But the life is of different degrees of consciousness, different degrees of awareness. The plants have a lower degree of consciousness. Also, a more simple element, element of water is 90% in the plants. Single element, lower degree of consciousness, and that food is extinguishing life at the lowest level. You go on to higher levels, insects and birds, the, the number of elements increases and the level of awareness increases. 
You go to mammals, it's called almost the same. And when you go to a human being, it's the highest. All five elements are there, and the highest level of awareness is there. If you kill a human being, the penalty is greater than if you kill an animal. If you pluck a plant, the penalty is even less. The effect on meditation, which involves the power of concentrating your attention, because that's really the secret of meditation is how to use your attention and how to concentrate it where you belong inside the head. That's the secret. How to use your attention, which is the only maneuverable part of consciousness that we have. What, what is around us, what we can see, we can't change. But where we put our attention, we can change. We can look this side or that side or inside or outside. It is the power to move our attention that enables good meditation to take place. So therefore, if we have to move our attention inside, then it should be the simplest distraction on that attention. The power of concentrating attention is a secret of meditation. Now, but we use that power of concentration every day. For example, when we read a book. Now, if you're reading a book and you have a certain rate of reading it, say you read a book at one minute a page, that's your normal reading rate, and then you go and kill a man and come and read the same book, you won't even cover half the page in 10 minutes or five minutes. What has happened? What has distracted your power of concentration is the extinguishing of life of another person which sits with you. And no matter how hard-hearted you are, it still affects your power of concentration. If you kill an animal, the distraction is less. The recovery time is less to get back to normal. Even if you pull a plant, pluck an apple, there is still a distraction. But so little, the recovery is almost immediate. So that is why these uh, practitioners, the mystics who have practiced the spiritual path through meditation, they have recommended take the simplest of food. Not only simple food, basically vegetarian, vegetable food, they have also said take small quantities of that food. Because large quantities, even of vegetarian food, can be equally <laughs> an impediment to meditation and concentration. So take limited quantities. And I tell you this, if you take, eat, just a general suggestion, if you eat half of what you're eating today, you'll be in better health. <laughs> just a simple observation. We overeat. We don't need to. So a preparation for that would be eat less, eat the simplest of food, and think good things, give good company, you're in preparation for the spiritual path. The basic thing is still you're seeking, but your seeking will sparkle. Then what will happen? If you are a seeker and following this method of preparation through your food, through your thoughts, through your company that you are keeping, you will find a human being in your life who will tell you, come along, we are on the same track automatically. This is marvelous. In India, people say that a guru or an enlightened person who can take you up can never be found because they are hidden amongst ordinary common people. They look ordinary people. You can never know. And those who claim to be gurus, which is a larger number, are not gurus at all. Because a true master will never say he's a master. He doesn't have to say that. He comes into your life through coincidence and doesn't have to say anything. So therefore, when your seeking is strong, that person comes into your life. They say in India, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. When a disciple is ready, the master appears. They don't say, when a disciple is ready, he'll find a master. You can't find. If you can really know who a master is, then you are a master yourself. There is no other way to really know who a master is. The master reveals himself or herself to you in stages, depending upon how much progress you make on the spiritual path. The master is an ordinary person exactly ordinary, sometimes more ordinary than most people. So therefore, how can you ever say, who is the master? So the master comes into your life through coincidence because he knows who the seeker is, where the seeker is, and can come there. If he cannot know who the seeker is, 
where the seeker is, he's not a master. He's not the type of master I am talking of. I am talking of a perfect living master who has united himself in the consciousness of all totality. And therefore, he can see himself in everyone that he meets. He can not only go into the minds of people, he can go into the soul, spirits of people and be one with them. And such a person, of course, knows us better than we know ourselves. So that is why when somebody like that comes into our life, we begin to recognize there is something in going on here. And then it moves on further. The number of coincidences begin to increase. And we begin to see these things didn't happen before. And now they started happening. The more we seek, the more these things start happening. And therefore, gradually we come to know that this was a preparation we were making to meet the master. And then the master, at the right time, when he thinks we are really ready, he initiates us. And I will talk to you a little bit more later in the afternoon about what initiation and the actual method of meditation is, which Perfect Living Masters have been teaching all the time.